All right. So Jeremiah 10.10. 10. But the Lord is the only, is the only true God. He is the living and everlasting king. So we have been establishing this Kings and Kingdom series where we have been looking at the fact that Jesus is the only true king that should be ruling and reigning in our hearts. He builds his kingdom in your heart. And so then we, we then live for him. And so we've been talking, last week we talked about really our, the posture of our heart. Posture meaning like where it's like where we're supposed to be focused at and that our heart is supposed to belong to Jesus as the one and true king that should be ruling and reigning our hearts, right? Uh, so this week, we're going to dive into the first king. We're going to be looking at this guy named King Saul. And so I just want to give you guys just kind of a little bit of a recap as we came in. You guys remember the Israelites, they rejected their king. They asked for a king to rule over them. And Samuel, the last judge, the first prophet, he then cries out to the Lord. And the Lord says, hey, let's gr grant it to him. Give it to him. And the reason he does this is to teach his people and then also to point to the need for Jesus. So he grants them a king. And we start with this guy named King Saul. So King Saul, he's a son of this guy named Kish uh, from the tribe of Benjamin. Okay. So he reigns from about 1050 BC. That's when he start, That's where he begins his reign. He becomes king when he's 30 years old. Okay. He rules for 40 years. Remember we talked about a monarchy, which is where Israel is ruled by one king for a united under one king for 120 years, the whole nation is. So he is 40 years of this, a third of this. Uh, his family was super wealthy, and this guy was very tall, dark, and handsome. Everybody thought he was like the most handsome guy in all of Israel, and he stood like uh, a shoulder's length above everybody else. And really the reason for that is because I told you last week, it's because the Israelites were actually pretty, they're pretty short. But this guy stood out. He was the guy that the people thought they wanted. They wanted a king that was like, that, that looked powerful, that looked like the image of what they wanted. And so we have this first guy. Uh, I think we got the next slide up there. Saul's heart posture, the first king. It's interesting that God chooses him. The guy was super insecure. When he, gets, when he gets anointed king and he gets announced by Samuel that he's going to be the king over the nation of Israel, this dude is found hiding in the luggage, in the baggage is what the Bible says. And they're asking, where's this king at that you have chosen for us? And he's hiding in the luggage, which is kind of crazy. So he's, he's insecure. Um, he's also very arrogant. He's a man that, like, um, he was very puffed up, very prideful, Okay. He was extremely disobedient. And not only was he disobedient, but he was full of excuses. He had an excuse, which is what we're going to be really diving into tonight. But ultimately, what he had was his heart posture was not postured after the Lord. His heart really didn't like belong to the Lord, and his actions didn't show that. So this first king that we have that we get to unpack tonight, well, he's going to teach us a lot of examples on how we, not, we should not act and the opposite of how where our heart should be postured. So, um, and the result of his heart posture, the result of all of these, uh, these character flaws of him, there's one more slide up there, guys, is the fact that the kingdom was torn from him and it was given to someone else with the right heart posture. The kingdom is taken away from Saul and it's given to David. And the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. So because of all of his disobedience, God takes the kingdom away from him. And not only does he take the kingdom away from him, this man loses his life and sort of his sons in battle. So it ends in disaster. It ends in disaster for this guy. And that word obey, we're talking about obedience. A heart postured after the Lord is a heart that obeys the Lord. Obey, that word, it just rings hard for everyone. Like, I never liked that word growing up. I had a hard time obeying. I still have a hard time obeying in certain areas. And I had plenty of excuses to justify my actions. There was this time where I had like a pop quiz dropped on us the night before when I was in school. And I was not prepared. That was not in like my plan to be able to study for this thing. So um, I had a lot to do. I had to hang out with some buddies. I had stuff to do at home, whatever it was that was going on. So I made up this thing to where I had like a sheet with all of the stuff, like all the things, like so I could cheat on the test. 
I was like, yes, all right, this is going to work perfectly. I had it right on my thigh, had myself positioned perfectly in the chair. And so I'm writing this stuff down. I'm like, this is going great. And then I hear this voice come from the crowd. Hey, Miss Connor, Miss Connor, Michael Fitzgerald, he's cheating. I'm like, what? I'm like, I'm going to hurt you. <laughs> yeah, I got completely called out, completely called out. So yeah, so I get called out for cheating. I get to go down to the office. And they tell me that, it, Derek, you need to go home. You need to tell your mom what you're doing. There's going to be a phone call that's going to come. There's going to, a phone call is going to come through, that kind of thing. And, I mean, this is before they had a phone, like, inside the classroom. You can call your parent right there. That happened when I got a little bit older in school where you had to call your parent in there. So I get home. You know, you're kind of like that feeling. You're sweating a little bit. You're like, oh, man, this is not going to go good for me. And we know what that feeling is. It's awful. And so I immediately go home and I start buttering up to my mom. I'm like, Mom, I'm like, you're looking really good today. You look, you look like you had a good day. Helping her do the chores, vacuuming in the house. I'm like trying to ease all of this out, right, before it comes. And then I hear the phone ring. And mom grabs the phone. This is when there was a long cord. And she's like wrapping it around her arm and like walking through the house. And, and then like you could see her, the, like her face change a little bit. She's getting more and more angry. I'm like, oh, crap. I'm in bad trouble right now. So she comes over to me. And she's like, Michael, what the heck did you do? And I'm like, I'm like Mom. You don't understand. I'm like, the pressure they were putting on me. Like, I had, like, a lot to do. Like, they can't just drop a quiz like this. So I start beginning with all of these excuses to justify what I was doing. When the reality of it was, I wasn't really sorry for what I was doing. I was just upset that I got caught. And so I had a slew of excuses to try to explain the fact that, like, hey, I did this. And my heart, really, the posture of it was not the fact that I wanted to obey. It was the fact that I just did it. And so I had all these excuses. And that's really what Saul, that's the problem with Saul. And that's what we get to see with him. Saul was a man that was very disobedient, and he had a lot of excuses to, to, to back that up. And so we can't really, like, dive into all of his disobedience, like all the stories that he has, because you'd get lost in them. But there's one story in particular that I wanted to unpack with you guys tonight. And it has to do with the Amalekites. When, when uh, God comes to Samuel and tells Samuel to tell Saul to go do something really crazy. So Ali asked you guys to bring your Bibles. So we're going to turn our Bibles to 1 Samuel 15. All right, 1 Samuel 15, starting in verse 1. This is crazy what is asked of Saul to do. God gives him a command, and this is nuts. I like the wrestling of papers. I'm hearing it. I'm hearing it. Okay, verse 1. One day Samuel said to Saul, It was the Lord who told me to anoint you as the king of all his people Israel. It says, he says, Now listen to this message from the Lord. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I have decided to settle my accounts with the nation of Amalek for opposing Israel when they came from Egypt. It says, now go and completely destroy the entire Amalek nation. This is crazy. Go destroy them. It says, Every, all the men, all the women, all the children, all the babies, all the cattle, all the sheep, all the goats, all the camels, and all the donkeys. Like God's asking him to do this. Isn't that crazy? Like it seems kind of harsh, doesn't it? This is a question that a lot of people in the world have a problem with when they get into Scripture. Like, how could, a God, how could a loving God allow something like this to happen? How could he command Saul to do something like this? And one thing I want to explain to you guys is as it says, he said he had to settle his accounts with the nation of Amalek for opposing Israel when they came out of Egypt. You see, when Israel was rescued out of Egypt by, the, by God, and they were beginning to go into this journey into the wilderness for 40 years. While they were out exiting this nation, these people by the name of the, Am, uh, the, the Amalek, Amaleks, whatever, they, they attack Israel. They attack them while they're on the run. And I mean, we're talking like they're completely vulnerable. They've just been rescued out of this place. Like they have all of their, their kids with them. They have all of their, their, their wives, their families, everybody. Two and a half million people just marching through in a caravan. And then they go and attack them. It's crazy. What ends up happening is Moses ends up 
having to raise the staff and these people hold his arms and as long as his arms are held up with the staff, God ends up um, defeating the Amalekites. But what ends up happening is God says, because they have done this, I will wipe them out in the generations to come. You see, the people that were in Canaan, the promised land that God promised to the Israelites, they were awful. Like these people were really, really bad. Like they were worse than even the Egyptians. They sacrificed babies. They did awful things. God wanted them to go in there and utterly wipe these people out. And so that seems kind of harsh, right? But it says in Genesis 15, the prophecy that he gave to, uh, with Abraham, when he said they were going to go into the promised land, it said in this prophecy that one day they were going to go into slavery in Egypt for, four, or for 400 some odd years, and that he would rescue them out. And then when he rescued them out, he said that, one day, that there's another one, the Ammonites. This is another tribe, the Canaanite people. He says, when the fullness of their like, indignation had come to pass. That sounds like a mouthful, so I'll just read it from what it says in this translation. Um, it says, four generations after your descendants will return here to this land, for the sins of the Ammonites have not yet warranted their destruction. So what God does is he, 400 years passes by of God's patience and God's mercy. Because the Bible says that it's not his will that anyone would perish, but all would come to repentance. Like that's what the Bible says. God's patient toward each and every one of you. But eventually the patience runs out. And God also knows every heart of every human being. And he knows the decision that you're already going to make. And so he already knew the decision these people were going to make. Their hearts had been so hardened against them. So he gives a command to Saul and says, you go and utterly wipe these people out. He gives him this command. So what do you think Saul does? Think he does it? Well, he's going to have some excuses. Let's read on. Let's see what he says. Okay. Let's jump down to verse 7. Then Saul, he slaughtered the Amalekites from Haleah all the way to Shur, east of Egypt. Okay. So he's, he's doing what God told him to do. He's going there. He's getting busy, right? But he captured Agag, the Amalekite king, but completely destroyed everyone else. Saw and his men spared Agag's life, and they kept the best of the sheep and the goats and the cattle and the fat calves and the lambs and everything. In fact, that appealed to them. They destroyed only what was worthless and of poor quality. That's crazy. God said to go and utterly wipe out everyone, destroy everything. But yet Saul, Saul is taking the king, he's taking the king back with him, and then he's only killing what's weak of the cattle, and he brings all this, all this cattle back, not being obedient. So this is what ends up happening in verse 10. So it says, Then the Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry that I ever made King Saul, for he has not been loyal to me, and he has refused to obey my command. Samuel was so deeply moved that he, when he heard this, that he cried out to the Lord all night. Like, this is the guy that God chose to, like, anoint Saul king. And so now he's, the, law is say, uh, the, the Lord is saying that he, re, he basically, he, I mean, he, re, uh, he re, oh my goodness, there we go, lost my sight. The Lord rejects him as king. So the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul, and someone told him, Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up a monument to himself. So Samuel gets up the next day. He's super upset, and he goes to find Saul to tell him what the Lord has said. And what's Saul doing? He's boasting about himself. He's at Carmel setting up a monument about himself, like he's proud about what he's done. Finally, when Samuel found him, Saul greeted him cheerfully. May the Lord bless you, he said. I have carried, you, I have carried out the Lord's command then what is all of this bleeding of sheep and goats and lowing of cattle I hear, Samuel demanded. So like here Saul is supposed to carry all this out and Samuel comes to calm out and he sees all this cattle and sheep like ma ba, all out there, all these things that are supposed to be destroyed and then there's the king of the actual leaders of the people they were supposed to hack down. And he says when Samuel says then, it says it's true that the army spared the best of the sheep, the goats and the cattle Saul admitted. But they are going to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. Here's the excuses. Like he's disobedient. And so now he's going to justify his disobedience with an excuse. 
we have destroyed everything else. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop and listen to what the Lord has told me this last night. What did he tell you, Samuel? Saul asked. What did he say? And Samuel told him, although you may think little of yourself, although you may think little of yourself, you are not the leader of the tribes. Are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king of Israel. And the Lord has sent you on a mission and told you, go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, until they are all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? Another excuse. But I did obey the Lord, Saul insisted. I carried out the mission he gave me. I brought back King Agag, but I destroyed everyone else. Then my troops bought in the best of the sheep, the goats, the cattle, and the plunder to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. But Samuel replied, here it is. What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than the offering of rams. And rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft. And stubbornness is as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you. The reason Saul disobeyed is because his heart was not postured after the Lord. That's why he disobeyed him. And that's why he had excuses to try to justify it. We think about this guy named Agag, this king, supposed to wipe him out. This guy shows up. Samuel ends up hacking him apart, but Saul obviously spared some more of his family because later on in the Old Testament with Esther, there's this guy named Haman. He's a family member of this guy. And he literally tries to genocide and wipe out all the Israelites, all of them. Like would make the thing that Hitler did like look like, like something even smaller. Like utterly wipe them out across the nation. All because... Saul was disobedient. There are consequences to our disobedience. I would wonder and ask you guys, what do you guys struggle with obeying? Because we can learn a lot from Saul. Is it your parents struggle obeying them? Being in school? Maybe you're a cheater like I was. Looking at things you shouldn't? having a dirty mouth, things that come out of your mouth, gossiping and slandering others, tearing other people down, saying things to them that you shouldn't be saying, especially when you're a follower of Christ, you claim to be, right? Making them feel this small, being called to do something, but you run in the opposite direction like the guy Jonah did in the Old Testament. Maybe it's not reading God's word because you're afraid if you open it up, it's going to convict you so badly. Like you see it sitting on your desk. You see it sitting there. You know if you open it up and you start to read it, it's going to start to convict you and it's going to start changing your life. So maybe it's not being obedient to even reading it because you're afraid of what it's going to do. Maybe it's insecurities like Saul had. It's one of the things that he struggled with. He was an insecure man. And because he was insecure, when he saw other people be better than him, it made him jealous, and it sent him into a mad rage. We'll see that with the life of uh, with David. When David is the next man, he's going to be anointed king, right? Saul still reigns for a lot of many years later. But because of his insecurities, because of his disobedience, it ends up like a wreck. I wonder what excuses that you're making in, in, in defense of your disobedience. God sees your heart. In James 1.22, one of my favorite verses, it's one of the most convicting verses. It says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to God's word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. This is crazy. I love how Jesus speaks because it's so relevant even today. It's like glancing at your, safe, uh, at your face in a mirror and then you see yourself, you walk away, and you forget what you looked like. It's like social media today. You guys are like, you know, five minutes later, you're over there like, you know, like, it's like, 
That's what it's like. You listen to the word, but you don't obey it. So you're only fooling yourself. God sees your heart. He knows where you're at. I mean, listen, guys, what's the reason? Why would we even want to obey God's word in the first place? Why should have Saul obeyed it? We obey God because we love him. That's why we obey his word. In John 14, 15, it says, if you love me, if you love the Lord, if your heart is postured after the Lord, it says, you will keep my commandments. You'll obey them. And why do we love him? Man, because he loved you first. He gave his life for you. God made a way of rescue to rescue you so you could have a relationship with him. And that was by sending Jesus Christ. It says in 1 John 4, 9, 4, 9, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. That's why we love God. That's why we want to obey him because he gave his life for you. It's the greatest act of love that it has ever been. I mean, God left the heavenly places, left, became a human being, so he's experiencing everything that you guys experience, getting picked on, people treating him awful, having to walk down the crappy streets and live in this hard world. He did all of that for you. And then they, then they rejected him. And so many of you probably are rejecting him right now. He gave his life on the cross. He was nailed to a cross, brutally beaten. And he took the punishment that you deserve. Literally, he took the punishment in your place. The sin, the awful things that you do, the things that separate us from God, when we disobey and go against him, our rebellion, he took that in our place. He took all that upon himself. And then he was buried in a tomb and he rose. And you can have life because of what he's done. When you look at, at that, that's what the good news is. When you look at that, that's why we obey him. When I think about why I obey him, I don't look at him as just a list of rules. Like, oh, these are things I just can't do. I look at that and I think, man, I'm going to obey you because you loved me first, because you did this for me. You gave your life for me. Man, I want to give my life to you. I wonder how many of you guys are making excuses to not obey. There's a consequence for sin. A lot of you guys are young, you don't think about that. There was a consequence for the Amalekites. They ended up being destroyed. There was a consequence for Saul. He ended up dying and his sons died. The Bible says the wage of sin is death. The wage, that's what you're owed for sinning and breaking his laws. You're owed death. That's the consequence for it. Like, that's crazy. Think about that for a second. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. If you haven't accepted that, it's death. Spiritually dead and physically dead. And that's crazy. And that's nothing to laugh about. So I wonder... Has anybody in here not made that choice? What are you being disobedient to? Maybe you're a follower of God. You're in this room. You've accepted him in your heart. Maybe that's you. And maybe you're still running in rebellion. Maybe you're still being disobedient. Maybe you're trying to make excuses for the things you're doing. You belong to him. Quit. Stop. Look at the love that he's extended to you. And if you don't, man, I would employ you guys. Turn to him. Let him change your heart. Let him change the posture of your heart. So that way you would see him and you would want to pursue him and follow him. I mean, with all of your heart. I want you guys to bow in prayer for just a moment. I don't want you guys to contemplate. I want you to think about that. In the New Testament, there's, in the book of Luke, Jesus gives a story about a guy that was putting on a huge banquet, huge feast. 
and he sent an invitation out to everyone. Everyone's invited. You're invited. This invitation goes to you. The man that's holding the banquet is God. And he's invited you. He sent all of his servants out to go invite everyone around. And in this story, people began to make excuses one after another. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. So the master, he said, then go out into the country lanes and find, find those to come so that my house will be full. Remember, God doesn't wish that anybody would perish, but all would come to repentance. He created you to have a relationship with him, each and every one of you. So here he is, knocking at the door, waiting for you to answer. But here's the thing. One of, the day, one of, the, one of these days, the door is going to shut to the banquet, and it'll be too late. It'll be too late. And this is what the master is going to say to those that are knocking at the door. For none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. That's crazy. If you haven't accepted Jesus, if your life is in turmoil, then turn to him now. He has a seat for you at his table. And his rules, they're not burdensome. It's awesome to follow him. Because it's what brings you closer to him. It's what makes you more like him. That's what a life abundant is. And if you're in here and you're walking it out and you're struggling, quit making excuses. 